Uh, my name is Stuart. And, and this. And my name is Neil. <laughs> Good to have you with us. Welcome to Holy Baptist Church. Today, we're going to be hearing a little bit more um, from Martin as we continue in the series of What Are You Made Of? And uh, this week's entitled Non Flammable. And, um, and we're looking at the story um, in the Bible of Daniel. And I guess no surprises, we're talking about the, the fiery furnace um, this morning. And, uh, and I wonder if we have situations which we think are too hot to handle, where maybe we find ourselves under pressure to conform to what everybody else is doing. Um, Stuart, can you think of an example of... Yeah, so, I mean, just loads of times in sort of professional life, kind of that you might come across situations or, you know, kind of things that are happening that you don't necessarily agree with. And, you know, you can you can, you can can choose to make a stand against that. And I've, I've personally had to do it. Um, but it's never easy, um, just because you know you're on you're under pressure from from people who who don't think or feel the same way, and so yeah, it, it's definitely something which you know I've had to to deal with. Yeah. I'm sure it's the same for you. Yeah, it's, I, it's, there's loads of little examples, aren't there? Where yeah. I don't know, you you finish work at five forty five, and everybody says, "Well, let's clock off at six o'clock." And do you say, <clears throat> "No, it's five forty five, and um, no, we shouldn't be claiming the extra," or do you just go along because no one will know and it's the accepted thing and there's small things like that. There's also bigger things, I guess, in our yeah. lives where um, we're suddenly put on that situation and we have to either make a stand or um, and or, or, we, or we conform. So, yeah, um, yeah ben, don't, me, don't you find that it's it's the little things that people notice? Yeah, 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 yeah. And once you make one stand, it's then perhaps easier to make the next because people, you know, will you know will, will yeah. understand that your values are maybe different um, to theirs. So anyway. Um, Let's um, let's remind ourselves a little bit more about what the sermons um, have been about in this series. What something is made of matters most when it's going to be stress tested, put under pressure or go through an unforgiving environment. Think about it. Before you put clothes in the washing machine or the tumble dryer, you need to know what they are made of. The problem is we often find out what something is made of when the damage has already been done. Don't- when we want to know what a person is made of, we apply the same principles. We put them on the spot or under pressure. And we stand back and watch what happens when the heat rises. We are going to learn from an ancient book called Daniel, named for its hero. Whatever he was made of, it was something which made Daniel the talk of the kingdom, the envy of not one but three kings, and the influencer of a nation that wasn't even his own. So we hope you'll join in for this series as we ask, what are you made of? So we are continuing our series looking at the book of Daniel on part three. So far we have had um, durable. Um, are you resilient? Are you a resilient person? Last week, um, David talked to us about are we unbreakable? Um, and this week we are looking at something which I think is particularly applicable to our current weather situation, are you non-flammable? So that's what we're going to be looking at uh, this morning. Um, Just a quick recap. Um, Daniel was a guy, along with his friends, who was taken out of his life in Jerusalem, where he was probably in a well-to-do family, maybe in the royal court, well-trained, taught everything he needs to know. He was a talented young man. He gets taken by King Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon to learn all their stuff and become a a talented young guy there instead. And we've been learning a little bit about Daniel and his story and the way that he stood up against the influence of the nation of Babylon and all their different gods and different ways of doing things. And we're going to continue looking at that, but we're not going to actually... um, talk about Daniel this morning, despite that we're talking about Daniel for the series, we're talking about his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which I only know those names because we did it so many times in Sunday school. And we're going to listen to a story that if you are familiar with church, will be familiar to you. But if you're not, then you're going to hopefully uh, enjoy a great story. I said grab a Bible if you have got one. Um, but if, you ha- um, if, you, if you've got one, if you've got your phone, turn to Daniel uh, chapter 3, and we'll go to that in a moment. Put your hands up if you like superheroes. Oh dear, this is going to be a fun morning. Uh, (laughs) I could count that number of hands on my 
number of hands, number of people in one hand. We've got a few. Okay, I won't bother asking you too many details about that. But there's a superhero, which isn't a really big name. In fact, he's quite a B character, really. Uh, but his name is Johnny Storm. Those who put your hand up, do you know who Johnny Storm is? Ian? Rings the... I'll leave backtrack there. Yes, I know him. He rings the bell. That's Anyone know who Johnny Storm is? He was one of the Fantastic Four. Well done. He is the human torch. The human torch. He turns into a ball of flame. Now, technically, we're talking about non-flammable uh, this morning, and he was certainly not non-flammable. But what the property he did have was, despite the flames, going, you know, despite being a big ball of fire, he was completely untouched by the heat. It didn't have any effect on him whatsoever. I think that would be a really useful property to have because going up in flames is not great. It tends to cause problems. But actually not being touched by the flames is really useful because when you find yourself in hot water, do you keep your cool or do you lose it? When the pressure's on, do you get hot under the collar? When they turn up the heat, do you boil over? Or maybe you have a hot temper, and when you lose it, everything around you goes up in flames. So we're going to look at three guys this morning who found themselves in a fiery furnace, literally, and yet kept their cool. So look at Daniel chapter 3. We're going to work our way through the story. We're going to read the whole of chapter 3. Have we got that on the screen? Oh, dear. We haven't got it on the screen, but we might have it at some point. Um, we were going to read through uh, chapter 3 and just draw out some points uh, from this. So here we go. Chapter 3, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide. Now, in my Bible, it tells me very helpfully, uh, if you're my age or younger, that in meters, it's 27 meters high and 2.7 meters wide. If you're in in imperial feet and inches, sorry, I haven't done the conversion. But it's about half the height of Trafalgar, um, Nelson's column in Trafalgar Square. Um, so he builds this big column. Now, if you listened to the sermon last week, um, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream where he saw a statue of himself with his head was gold and the rest of the body, the statue, was made up of different materials suggesting there was different kingdoms that were going to follow after King Nebuchadnezzar. His kingdom wasn't going to last forever. And I don't know if this is connected, but it's almost as if Nebuchadnezzar is going, well, you only said my head was gold, actually. This whole thing is gold, because my kingdom is going to last forever. We're not told exactly what, it's, what it is. It's a rather more of an obelisk sort of shape than a, a human person. But regardless, King Nebuchadnezzar builds this gold obelisk, 27 meters high. Possibly not made out of solid gold, but it certainly looked like it. And he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And then he summoned the satraps, satraps, so they're kind of the local rulers, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial governors assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. So imagine the scene. You know, Babylon's a pretty shiny place with all the sun. It's warm. It's a bit like today. And you can imagine that sun bouncing off this gold obelisk. And all these people, these important people, gathered around outside the city gates, possibly, ready to do something. What are they going to do? Let's find out. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and people of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. Notice commanded, not suggested. This is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound, ready, of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will, be immediately, will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. 
Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the ziva, the lyre, the harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and people of every language fell down and worshipped the image of God that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar has probably done this for a strategic reason. It's a great way of uniting a group of people. It said different nations, different languages, all under the banner of the Babylonian Empire. A really great way of uniting them is to have them all worshipping the same thing. And you can imagine all these people, all these officials on that plane, bowing down in the dust before what was essentially just a big gold stick coming out of the ground. Notice the reputation. Petition of the names of the people there. It's almost as if the person who's writing this is having a bit of a laugh about all these important people groveling in the dust. It reminds me a little bit of some kids' songs or nursery rhymes that repeat the same things over and over again, like the old lady that swallowed the fly. I don't know why. Maybe perhaps you're dying. And you repeat the same thing over and over again. Actually, when the, um, uh, the Jews wrote their Greek version of this, they took all that repetition out. But actually, we've kept it because I think it shows that actually this is supposed to be a little bit amusing, poking fun at these really important people bowing down to King Nebuchadnezzar's statue. So the reality is you are being asked to bow down to something that isn't God's. We live in a society, in a culture, in a community where we are being encouraged, perhaps even pressured, to bow down to certain things, certain ways of thinking, certain ways of doing. I'm not going to come up with suggestions, but you can probably think of some things that you feel pressure to conform to. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about the pressure of social media. Social media is a great way of pressuring people to conform to certain ways of doing. And it's human nature to conform. That's what we do. That's, they talk about social proof. The more people do it, the more that it proves that it's right. Now, reality is social proof. That's not, it doesn't work. Just because lots of people are doing it or saying on social, social media doesn't mean it's actually correct. But that's a natural way we respond as human beings. We like to conform to what everyone else is doing. And what makes that even more um, like to happen in this place here is actually there's a sense of compliance as well. King Nebuchadnezzar is saying, you will bow down. You will bow down. What would you do in that situation? How would you respond? Well, let's just see how um, some guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, friends of Daniel's, exiles from Jerusalem, Jews, let's see how they responded to this command. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to the king, to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, ziva, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. Okay, we know that. We've had that bit before. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province. So these are important guys. If you read in the previous chapter, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have been given really powerful, influential positions in, the, in, in Babylon, despite the fact they were Jews. Um, but there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you. Oh, that's a way of winding up a king, isn't it? They pay no attention to you. It's a bit like our children. Your majesty, they neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. So the pressure has moved from compliance to now malice. You have a group of people, some astrologers, it says here, who have decided they're going to tell on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, we haven't been told what they've done, but we, obviously it's obvious. They have refused to bow down to this image of gold. They refuse, along with all the other officials and the whole nation, to grovel on the ground towards this image. You can imagine it's a bit like musical bumps. You know, that's, the music stops and you all fall down to the ground. It's the other way around, but the music starts 
and everyone just drops to the floor. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego must have stood out a little bit, just looking around at everyone bowing down. So we've now got malice there, fueled by, could be jealousy, more of that next week, in next week's story. It could be dislike. We've got obviously a racial dislike here. It could be distrust or it could be self-advancement. So we don't know, but actually some people have told on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So let's see what happens. Verse 13. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these people were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now then, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, harp, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. So actually, King Nebuchadnezzar has given them a way out here. Look, I've heard rumors. You haven't been doing what I've asked you to do. But here's your chance. If you bow down, then we'll forget any of this happens. But if you do not worship it, you'll be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what gods will be able to rescue you from my hands? So here we've moved from compliance to malice to intimidation. You've got this king in a rage. And you don't want to be around a king in a rage because the king in a rage is likely to mean your death. Okay, so we've moved to intimidation. Threats of violence. Once again, what would you do in that situation? Now, most of us have not been in that situation, but we do have people in this church who have perhaps been in that situation where they've experienced compliance, malice, and, intimid and um, what did I say? intimidation to the point where they have to make a decision. Am I going to bow down to foreign gods? Am I going to do something that goes against my conscience and what I believe and my values? Or am I going to make a stand? Let's see what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do. They replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set I don't know if I could have responded like Meshach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego responded in this situation. I think what's key to notice here is they did not get defensive. And actually, they say, we don't need to defend ourselves against you. And they kept their cool. They were respectful. They didn't shout or rage. They were facing with impending death. They were faced with an angry king. Yet they resp remain respectful, calm, they say, we haven't got the need to defend ourselves. I remember before I um, left to train to become a, a minister, a leader of a church, I was a teacher in a high school. And um, in my department, I was a design and technology teacher in a high school. And um, when they found out I was a Christian, which they found out fairly early on, and when, particularly when they found out I was going to train to become a church minister, they decided every Friday lunchtime would be ministry hour where they would ask me questions about Christian faith, and I would have to give them answers. That didn't go down to, that didn't work really well, because they would ask me some really, um, well, one, difficult questions, two, very pointed questions, and three, they were just trying to wind me up, uh, basically, which actually, being a bunch of blokes in the design and technology department happened a lot. Um, and what I found was I got defensive because I didn't know the answers to some of the questions. Some of the stuff was like, I don't even know where that's coming from. Also, I got defensive because they were picking on me. They were picking on the things that I valued. And often when we feel attacked or we don't know how to respond, then we get angry and annoyed. And my head of department had to put a stop to the ministry hour because it was getting a little bit out of hand. See, how do you respond? 
when you come under attack. It might be about your faith. It could be all sorts of things. How do you respond? Are you the sort of person that loses your temper? Are you the sort of person who gets hot under the collar? Are you the sort of person who you feel the heat rising and you become defensive? See, the problem with when you get defensive, you become forceful, you become assertive, you become annoyed, you perhaps become angry, and you stop listening. Communication breaks down. This very much echoes what we see in Jesus, how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego responded to attack and imminent violence is the same Jesus responded to the Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, and Pilate, the Roman governor, when they were threatening to execute Jesus. He remains silent. He remains respectful. And when he does feel the need to respond, what he does is just speak the truth. There is no need to defend himself. It reminds me of a quote from Charles Spurgeon, who was a great Baptist um, preacher uh, in the 19th century Victorian times. In fact, he was a celebrity at those days. He says this, defend the Bible, I'd sooner defend a line. You don't defend the Bible, you open its cage and let it roar. Sometimes we just need to speak the truth. We don't need to explain ourselves. We don't need to defend ourselves. We just need to speak the truth. Now, I'm going to take a quick aside here. Okay, We're not quite get to the end yet. There's one more point I want to make. But just a quick aside. In, am I saying, therefore, that as Christians in, an, in a society where we're increasingly being pushed to the margins, we're no longer a Christian country, in that situation, do we therefore not defend ourselves when we are attacked. So we're having lots of court cases. We've got the, they call it the gay cake thing, where some bakers were um, asked to make a cake to support gay marriage, and they refused, and it went through the courts for years. We've got a case recently of a doctor who refused to um, use someone's pronoun that they wanted to be uh, referred to. He lost that case. We've got numerous cases of, cases of Christians coming under attack because of their beliefs. Some with one, some we've lost. Am I therefore saying we should not defend ourselves? Well, my question is, who are we called to defend? Who are we called to defend? So I believe that free speech is being threatened by certain areas. I believe that uh, the needs, the ability, the freedom to act in our conscience is being Threaten, we're going through pressure to compliance. We might move to malice and possibly to intimidation. But who are we called to defend? Actually, we're called to defend everyone. We're called to love our neighbor as ourselves, regardless of who our neighbor is. We're called to stand up for the rights of everyone, regardless of religion, sexuality, regardless of what they believe and how they think. We are called to stand up not for our own rights, but for the rights of those who are not the ones in power, not the big, loud people, but those who are the least in our society, those or least in the views of society. Those are people who maybe struggle to have a voice. Those are the people that we are called to stand up for, not to defend our rights. It reminds me of a guy called Thomas Halwis, who you probably never heard of, but he was the first, he started the first Baptist church in the 16th, early uh, 17th century, um, started the first English Baptist church in this country. And he said these words, the first example of religious liberty. He says this, and he, he made the mistake of writing this to King James I, ended up in prison, he died in prison about age 40. He says, for men's religion to God is between God and themselves. The king shall not answer for it. So at that time, you had to be Church of England. That was the law. So he says, the king shall not answer for it. The king cannot tell you what you believe. Let them be heretics, so atheists. Let them be Turks, that's Muslims, Jews, or whatsoever. He actually doesn't even mention Baptists or Christians there. 
He says he stands up for the religious freedom of everyone and was willing to die for it. I'll leave that there. Let's go on phrase with that. Let's finish our story. Let's see what happens. Verse 19, then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace to be heated seven times hotter than usual, a bit like our weather coming up tomorrow, and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor had a hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched. There was no smell of fire on them. They were non-flammable. The Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angels and rescued his servants. And the story goes on to the end of the chapter. He actually promotes them and praises their gods. Everything works out. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they win this contest. God is there in the midst of them, so much so the king sees what looks like the Son of God there in the midst of the fiery furnace. But my question as we come to a close is, what if that didn't happen? What if these guys were thrown into the fiery furnace and poof, they were gone? It wouldn't make quite such a good story would it? But does it matter? And I turn back to verse 18, those words of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Think confident that God would save them, God would deliver them. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set. They have confidence in God. They trust God. I don't know if I would trust God in that situation. I don't know if I would stand up like they did. And they know, actually, even if we die, that we're not going to capitulate. It's a nice word, capitulate. We're not going to give in to what you are telling us to do. Their obedience was not dependent on God's provision. Their obedience was not dependent on God's provision. Reality is you will find there are difficult times in your life. You have perhaps experienced them. You're perhaps experiencing them now. And you, if you're not, you will experience them in the future. We are not promised that everything will be okay. Sometimes we will be in the fiery furnace and that's it for us. Sometimes it will seem like God is not there, that God is not in control. Everything goes completely wrong. And the question is, do we have hope despite that? It says these words in Romans um, chapter 5, verse 3 to 5. Not only so, but we also glory in our suffering. This is the words of Paul to the church in Rome. Because we know that sufferings produce perseverance perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Paul's saying here is that the more we suffer, the more we come against things, the more we have to persevere through difficulties, the more we are chucked into the fiery furnace, actually it produces perseverance, character, and hope. If you um, watch 
our Friday night worship on, you, on um, Facebook on a Friday evening at six, 8 o'clock. Um, Jen, my wife, shared these uh, words. She felt uh, it's, a, it's an acrostic when you have the words and then you have words off. And she took the word hope and created an acrostic. Hope. H. Healthy. Hope keeps our heart and mind positive. O. Onwards. It keeps us moving forward one step at a time rather than falling back on ourselves. P. Peaceful. It creates peace in our life despite our circumstances. But E, it's eternal. And that's something that's key for if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, despite the rubbish in our world, because our world is rubbish a lot of the time, we have hope. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, but thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You have victory over every difficulty, over every circumstances, because you are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. God is with you in the depths of your pit that you find yourselves in. And although your circumstances may change, the truth and the reality is there is a fourth guy in the fiery furnace. There is God with you, and there is hope, maybe not in, in, the, in the present situation there is a future hope. That has fueled countless people over the last 2,000 years plus who have died as martyrs for the Christian church, willing to stand up for what they believe to the point of death. I don't know if I could do that. But I believe once as the pressure increases on us as a church and as followers of Jesus, pressure creates perseverance. Perseverance creates hope. And if we have hope, we are able to stand up against anything. We are able to be non-flammable. We're going to listen to some questions now. And just use this time just to uh, think, listen to God, and engage with what I've just shared. <laughs> Do you feel a pressure to conform? Is it causing you to act and talk in a way that's contrary to your values? How do you respond to criticism? Are you defensive, embarrassed, apologetic? Are you in a situation where you need to know that God is with you? Because he is. And that was uh, that was really challenging. Uh, what Martin was, was sharing there. Um, so yeah, just kind of picking up on the on that theme. So kind of you know where where do you feel uh, pressure to to conform? Um, yeah, how how do, how does that fit in with your 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 normal life? You know, kind of you know being being a Christian now is so other than than society. And so yeah, I guess there's so many places where I guess it, it, there's conflict. What, yeah. what, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. We were talking a little bit earlier about um, sort of individual um, situations, about you know work situations where you feel to um, feel in. But but you're absolutely right because the whole of society is moving, and and you know some of the Christian values that we maintain um, are, are difficult in in modern society to keep up. And I, I quite like the bit in the um, in Martin's message about um, what happened if they'd been thrown to the fiery furnace and they got burnt. Yeah, and, and 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 the truth is, well, that sometimes happens. And um, but the good news is, is is that God is with us. We were talking about earlier on that God is with us through all circumstances. And I quite I can't remember what the H O P E stood for, um, but that that idea of hope and the fact it is eternal yeah. and and w what we have and the God we have is, is with us. And 
so when we are under pressure to conform and um you know and hopefully we'll never be in a situation <laughs> like those three yeah, blokes but the definitely. good news is that god is with us yeah absolutely yeah, yeah I, I completely i completely agree yeah yeah yeah. So if, if you've been challenged and you've got questions, um, feel free to send an email to um, gotquestions at hollybaptist.co, uh, sorry, .org.uk. <laughs> and um, something that you've heard today and you think, well, actually, what about this? Um, send a question to that and somebody will respond. And and, and we'd love to hear from people as, as to what they've um, what they've heard and what they've thought. So please feel free to do that. And if you've enjoyed what you've um, heard this morning, and um, please feel free um, to share it. Um, join dot in at Holy Baptist um, is another one of our um, um, email addresses. So yeah, do share it with people you think might like to hear that message. Um, but yeah, so that'd be great.